This week, the Super Mario Brothers movie opened in theaters. There was another Mario movie 30 years ago, which officially kicked off the trend of adapting video games into movies. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it really doesn't. So here's my list of every video game movie that's rated PG-13 or lower. So a lot of the ones like Resident Evil, that's not going to be on the list. Plus, some honorable mentions. Now for the honorable mentions, I chose movies that are set in the world of a video game, but are not directly an adaptation of one. And keep in mind, I've only played some of the games that these are based off of, such as Uncharted, so I'm only reviewing these as movies for the most part, and not based how faithful they were to the source material. And let's get started. Number 28 in last place is Super Mario Brothers from 1993. The first attempt at a video game movie is also the worst attempt at a video game movie. This movie isn't even enjoyable in a so bad it's good way like some of the other films on this list. It's just straight up bad. The plot is absolute nonsense and has nothing to do with the game, even remotely. Feels like a gigantic slap in the face. And even as a film on its own, not connected to Mario, it's still torture. This has one of the worst scripts of any movie. It's loaded with incredibly bad ideas and even worse acting. And for some reason tries to say that not only are Mario's names Luigi Mario and Mario Mario, but that also Luigi was adopted by Mario, but they're also brothers. Yet Luigi says Mario is his father, but they're also brothers. This makes no sense. The characters from the game aren't even recognizable as who they are. Toad looks like a human, Yoshi looks like a terrifying Jurassic Park dinosaur instead of friendly and cuddly, and the game doesn't have any of the same rules, lore, fun, or whimsy as the games it's supposedly based off of, making you wonder if they even bothered to play it in the first place. This is a huge game over. Number 27, Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Now, if this were a Mortal Kombat fan film with a bunch of cosplayers who just wanted to have fun and make this with what they had available at home, I could respect its ambition a bit more. But since this is an official movie made by a multi-million dollar Hollywood studio, it is a huge mistake. Part of the charm of the first Mortal Kombat is, yeah, it was cheesy, but everyone was having so much fun with it, it was easy to watch, not take it too seriously. This doesn't have any of the charm of the first one, and somehow, despite it coming out two years later, the effects look like 10 times worse. Granted, the effects in the first one weren't great either, but this one looks like it was made on a budget of $5, with glaringly obvious green screen in every single shot, and even worse creature effects. And the fights in the first film, those were fun to watch, but this doesn't even have that going for it, as even the fights in this movie are just incredibly boring. I can enjoy the first one, but this one is a huge fatality. Number 26, Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within. Now, this came out in 2001. And I will say, for the time, it has somewhat decent animation and a pretty solid voice cast behind it. But I watched this not having played a single Final Fantasy game, and I was totally lost the entire time. This movie expects the audience to have already played the Final Fantasy games and doesn't care to explain anything. It does have some interesting ideas about spirituality and the afterlife, but it comes off as so pretentious. Frankly, it doesn't even feel like a movie it just feels like a compilation of video game cutscenes. I don't know what the fans of the Final Fantasy games think of it. It's clearly geared more towards only that very specific audience. But for me, I was just lost and confused the entire time. Number 25, DOA, Dead or Alive. This is a movie that feels very much like it was made by Robert Rodriguez, even though he wasn't involved with it at all. And it follows the same basic template as every very similar video game movie based on this, like Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat, we're going to gather a group of fighters from around the world and have them fight each other in a tournament. Pretty simple idea, and the fights in this movie are a ton of fun. This is like the original Mortal Kombat movie from 1995, but way more insane. But the reason it is so low on this list is I have a huge, huge issue with how all the women characters in this movie are very poorly handled. They're all incredibly sexualized, and the film feels disgustingly exploitative. Michael Bay doesn't even objectify the women in his films as much as this film does. When I say that you did something better than Michael Bay, or worse than Michael Bay, you know you screwed up. This had the potential to be another fun, cheesy martial arts video, video game movie, but its over-the-top exploitative attitude was just way too much for me. Number 24, Tomb Raider, The Cradle of Life. Now, I'm not a fan of any of the Tomb Raider movies, but sometimes they can be somewhat entertaining. 
But out of all the Tomb Raider movies, this is the one I genuinely hate. To give you an idea of what kind of movie this is, it starts out with Angelina Jolie punching a shark. That's how the movie starts. And it only gets more bonkers from then on. The story is an absolute mess. And though I like Gerard Butler and other stuff, he has no chemistry with Angelina Jolie in this movie. I do not buy them as a couple one bit, even when they're doing a love-hate dynamic. And the film starts out from being so bad it's good to being just straight up unwatchable. Number 23, Angry Birds 2. The first film took what little concept was there and managed to craft a somewhat mildly entertaining film out of it. And this one is trying way too hard. There are so many out of place pop culture references and the jokes are incredibly annoying and go on for way too long. For example, there's a scene where the character has got a device that can detect eagles. And for like a full minute of the movie, you just hear, there's an eagle nearby, there's an eagle nearby, there's an eagle nearby. Did that annoy you? Well, congratulations, try sitting through that over and over for five minutes. I'm also not a fan of how there's these three children birds that have their own subplot, and one of the jokes is that one of them repeatedly swears. Okay. The jokes are also very random and out of nowhere, and they don't feel naturally placed at all. It feels like the studio was trying way too hard to be hip. So as a result, the film just comes off as cringy throughout, and it insults the viewer's intelligence. Number 22, Angry Birds. I'm honestly not sure who this movie is for. There are way too many innuendos and other adult references for the kids, and at the same time, the film was too loud, lowbrow, annoying, and childish for the adults. It does have some moments that are mildly amusing, like with the anger management class and the stories about the yellow bird and the big red bird are there. Those got some laughs out of me. And while the film didn't completely anger me, it didn't quite bring home the bacon either. And if you thought that joke was dumb, that joke is still smarter than most of the jokes in this movie. Number 21, Need for Speed. This movie didn't really appeal to me all that much because I'm just not that into racing. It has some fun stunts, but honestly, not that much else. I found both the story and characters very bland. I just couldn't get into it. But I suppose if you're a fan of the Fast and Furious films, which is a franchise I haven't gotten into yet, but I'll probably start watching those around the time the next one's coming out, you'll probably appreciate it. I just didn't find myself very invested. Number 20, Tomb Raider. Now, I do think that Alicia Vikander is a much better Lara Croft. Sorry, Angelina Jolie fans, she is. But the character herself is still not that interesting. Frankly, for a movie called Tomb Raider, there's not a lot of tomb raiding. Most of it centers on Lara trying to find her father rather than an artifact. The film also doesn't feel as fun as the original. The film comes off as a bit too serious, and it doesn't really let the audience have a lot of fun with it. Lara is also pretty unbelievable as a character, as you never feel like she's in any actual danger. For example, there's a scene where she's able to take out a bunch of bad guys who have guns using just a bow and arrow. And conveniently enough, these bad guys also have the aim of a stormtrooper. The film has a semi-interesting villain with Walter Goggins and a subplot about an evil secret society, but I don't feel like they're used to their full potential. And the film also doesn't feel very self-contained, it just does feel like a part one of a franchise that isn't even going to continue with the story anyway. Number 19, Lara Croft Tomb Raider from 2001. This film is fine. I mean, it's entertaining, it gets the job done, it's a fun popcorn flick at times, and you can tell this was made in 2001, as the action is very clearly trying to copy the style of films like The Matrix. Lara Croft, as I've said before, very boring main character. She doesn't feel like she's in any sort of danger that she changes throughout the film. Then we got Daniel Craig as the villain, and he's kind of fun. But overall, very bland film. Number 18, Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Honestly, I think this film's biggest issue is the pacing. I had a lot more fun with the first one. I thought the first one was a lot more entertaining and the story flowed better. This one, there were a few things that stood out. Idris Elba's Knuckles is really good. He's really intimidating, but at the same time, also kind of funny. And there are some fun action sequences and some lines I thought were kind of witty. But the story of this movie is so bogged down by the time we get to the second act. The first act is pretty fun. The third act is really fun. But everything in the middle is so uninteresting. Because the film takes a huge detour from the main story about Sonic and the Chaos Emeralds to give us like 10 or 15 minutes of James Marsden in a wedding, and it's so boring and unfunny. It really pads the runtime. And even then, some of the stuff involving Sonic in the second act pads the runtime. We don't have time to expand the lore of the universe or explain about the Chaos Emeralds, which would be interesting and a good way to use that time, but we do have time for a dance battle. 
There is just so much filler in the second act, which really brings it down. But it does pick up a bit with the third act. The climax of the movie feels straight out of a video game or cartoon. That was entertaining, but it just makes me wish we had had more of that in the film. Now, I do have one issue with the third act, though. Sonic, apparently out of nowhere, is afraid of water. This is never set up. It wasn't set up in the previous film. It just is there. That was another issue. And the human characters in this movie, they're so boring. The film focuses way too much on them. It has some good moments for Sonic fans, but it has a ton of pacing issues that bring it down drastically. Number 17, Double Dragon. I will acknowledge, yes, this film is incredibly stupid. But it's also incredibly fun. Released in 1994, this film was set in the distant future of 2007. A distant future of 2007 where Los Angeles has become a fusion of the post-apocalyptic worlds of Mad Max and Waterworld. And yes, it's incredibly overreacted, but darn it, this film entertains me. It's got some decent fight choreography. It's just mindless fun. It's not good, but it can be highly entertaining if you just decide to embrace its stupidity. Number 16, Street Fighter, The Legend of Chun-Li. I like this film fine, but I highly prefer the first one. Because this one, to me, just doesn't come off as fun or self-aware. It still has some fun action. And Neil McDonough is a pretty good villain as Bison. He still gives a fun performance, though. He is a bit miscast. He works pretty well as a decent origin story for Chun-Li. And at times kind of gives off Batman Begins vibes. But, like I said, I have a lot more fun with the first one. Number 15, Street Fighter. What's great about this film is that everyone gives 110% to their performances, even though they know this film is incredibly stupid. But you can kind of tell they're all in on the joke, they're fully committed, and yeah, there's some wild miscastings, like getting Jean-Claude Van Damme, a French actor, to play the American, and Rahul Julia to play a Russian, but they give such delightfully over-the-top performances, you just don't care. It's a film that's just mindless fun, by no means is it high quality, but it is massively entertaining. Number 14, Mortal Kombat from 1995. I do not mind that this movie is PG-13. I still have a lot of fun with it. It's just so incredibly absurd. And the characters, when you break it down, there's no logic to these characters. Three of them are ninjas. One's a movie actor. One's a monster. These are all just random characters. But it is so fun to see them fight. And this movie is over the top in the best way. It's just a fun turn off your brain movie even if it's not quite a flawless victory. Number 13, Wing Commander. A movie with a very thin plot and characters that aren't that interesting, but I still had a lot of fun with it. This is like if you put Top Gun and a somewhat cheaper version of Star Wars, if you fused them together, this is what you would get. It's got some fun aliens, some fun space battles, and you get to see both Matthew Lillard and Freddie Prinze Jr. in this movie before they were both in Scooby-Doo. For me, it's just a fun, cheesy sci-fi movie that's easy to watch. Number 12, In the Name of the King, A Dungeon Siege Tale. This is a cheesy fantasy movie in the same vein of Willow or Legend. It's also got a great cast, and though the performances can be a little bit over the top, and it can be really hard to buy into Jason Statham playing a guy who's supposed to learn not to be a coward, it's still fun. What is best about this movie, though, is the stunts. The action and stunts in this movie, quite frankly, are mighty impressive. If you're a fan of fantasy movies and you want to put on something that you're probably having a good time with and not take that seriously, this is for you. Number 11, Max Payne. Now, out of all the movies on this list, this is one I think is the most stylized and distinct. This is a very interesting style, being a detective noir comic book with a very gothic atmosphere. It's got a pretty interesting story and some cool ideas, and it doesn't require that much of your attention. It's just Mark Wahlberg is a detective shooting at bad guys because he's out for revenge, trying to solve a murder. It's a fun movie, even if it doesn't really have the best ending, but for what it is, I think it's decent. Now, before I get to my top 10 on the main list, here are my honorable mentions. Like I said, there's movies that aren't directly based off of video games, but video games do factor into the plot made to some degree. Honorable mention number nine, The Wizard. Now, this has a good child cast and a plot reminiscent of Ferris Bueller, though it's not as fun as that film. It's also very dated, being nothing more than a commercial for Nintendo. And I guess if you grew up in the 80s, you can appreciate it, but I just feel bad for those who paid for a ticket and got a commercial. If you ask me, everybody in this theater is a giant sucker, especially you! Honorable mention number eight, Spy Kids 3, Game Over. The movie is called Spy Kids, yet there's nothing about this movie even remotely spyish. This feels like this was originally conceived as a completely different film, but since the Spy Kids franchise was Robert Rodriguez's cash cow at the time, he tried to rework it into a Spy Kids movie. 
and if you're not watching it in 3D, it's kind of pointless. Sylvester Stallone gives a fun performance as the villain in what is arguably his charmingly hammiest role, and the rules of the writing of the film, though, are incredibly inconsistent, where important details are just glossed over, making me believe that there weren't that many drafts of the script. Like, why was the toy maker trapped in cyberspace by the secret agents? The film's answer, and this is direct from the film, mind you, is, who knows, it was years ago. Like, really? That's an interesting idea to explore, but we're just going to gloss that over. The film also says that Judy's grandpa has beef with the toy maker because the toy maker caused grandpa to lose his legs and betrayed their agency. Like, are we going to go into more detail about that? Are we going to show how they went from enemies to how they went from friends to enemies? No, we're going to barely touch on that. And also, this race, the mega race, it's said to have no rules, and yet it's later said that a character got reset to level one earlier for cheating during this race. Cheating during a race that has no rules. And also, Sylvester Stallone has hologram versions of himself that at one point he's able to throw something and it goes straight through it, but yet later in the movie he's able to slap one of them and it hits the camera. So yeah, there's no consistency to the rules of this film. But the last 15 minutes where all the previous characters from the other two films team up as this franchise's equivalent of the portal scene from Avengers Endgame, that's fun. And Elijah Wood has a very fun, oh, very brief cameo. The world of the game is also very creative. It's entertaining, but I definitely notice a lot more problems now watching it as an adult. Honorable mention number seven, Tron. The world of this movie is very interesting and it has kind of a creative story. Now this came out at a time where computers were still new and we were wondering what could be done with them. It's got some interesting philosophical ideas about if the programs are actually alive, does that mean the programmers are God, who's really controlling who? But the film's effects, they get this movie came out in 1982, but I'm sorry, the film's effects are really bad and its pacing is slow. I'm sure it was impressive for the time, but if I'm having a choice between which Tron movie to watch, I'm gonna put on Tron Legacy instead. Honorable mention number six, Pixels. A film that had a lot of potential with its fun premise being Ghostbusters for video games, but as far as execution goes, it falls a bit short. The biggest issue being the cast. This is an Adam Sandler comedy where he's not working with Drew Barrymore. Instead, we get Josh Gad, Kevin James, and Peter Dinklage. And it's also highly sexist to both genders. It has an outdated stereotype that dudes who play video games are awkward losers who can't get dates. And for the women, all the women characters in this movie are literally considered trophies. But at least it's sexist to both genders, so yay for progress! It has some fun 80s references. It's fun having aliens be arcade game characters but it needed a different cast and a smarter script. It's entertaining, but it is highly, highly flawed. Honorable mention number five, Wreck-It Ralph. A highly entertaining film with a lot of heart. This has a lot of the same ideas as Toy Story with the, with the arcade characters all interacting with each other after hours, and at the same time also has a cute story about a video game bad guy trying to prove he's good deep down. There's a ton of really great sharp jokes in this. Every game has a unique style, like Ralph's game having very blocky, choppy movements, Heroes Duty game looking a bit more slick, and there are a lot of details in the background and foreground. It's got a great story and great characters. Honorable mention number four, Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle. A worthy follow-up to the original that updates it, while also staying true. The actors in this movie have a ton of fun, it's got some great messages, and is highly entertaining and smart. But there's honestly no reason for this to be PG-13. There is a fair bit of off-color humor and some crass windows that really felt unneeded. You could have easily made this a PG movie. Honorable mention number three, Ready Player One. This has a lot of fun pop culture references that really feel passionate, and man, this is the ultimate geek movie. It's got some great villains, it's got a great cast, but the problems you have with it are the exposition is very tell-don't-show. There are modern pop culture references that feel somewhat out of place, given that so much about this movie is appreciating 80s pop culture, and I am a bit mixed on the ending. I get the intent was good, but there are some people who make their living and go to school in this virtual world, and what are they supposed to do once a week when you shut off the game? Honorable mention number two, Free Guy. Personally, I find this movie very creative with a lot of imagination. I think it has a fun world to explore, and it has a lot of the same ideas as Tron about if video game characters were actually sentient, and does that make the programmers their rulers? Though the execution is not nearly as pretentious as it was in Tron. What holds it back, though, is that uh, the cameos from gamer YouTubers, that's really going to date this movie in 20 years. And there's also some very lowbrow, very crass jokes and negative stereotypes about gamers, and that kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. 
I also find it ironic that one of the messages is about how doing nothing but remakes and sequels is bad, and yet this is a movie owned by Disney, and they announced yesterday that they're doing a remake of Moana, which is a movie that came out less than 10 years ago, so that's kind of hypocritical of you, Disney. It's a fun movie, but those are my issues with it. And honorable mention number one, before we get back to the main list, is Tron Legacy. Before Joseph Kaczynski directed Top Gun Maverick, he did another Legacy sequel, appropriately titled Tron Legacy. This expands on the ideas of the first one, and in some ways, does them better. The Daft Punk score is one of my favorite scores in movies. It's got a lot of fun action, and I know some people have an issue with the DH CGI Jeff Bridges, but given that that version of him is a computer program, I think it can be argued that that helps distinguish who's the real character, so you're not confused about which one is the evil Jeff Bridges. So I don't have that big of an issue with it. I love this movie, and I think it's very underrated. And that's it for the honorable mentions. Now back to the main list with the top 10. Number 10, Warcraft. It's very interesting that this film makes the orcs sympathetic characters. The orcs, who in Lord of the Rings are these vicious, bloodthirsty, heartless monsters. And it makes the main character an orc, who is someone with a family who was victimized by the humans who are at war with them. And there's also heroes and villains on both the human and orc side, very much like the Planet of the Apes prequels. I think the action in this movie is very fun. I think the film is very well made. It has marvelous visual effects, though its world building does feel a bit rushed, and the film also doesn't feel very self-contained. Number nine, Monster Hunter. Yes, this movie is stupid, but it's exactly my kind of stupid. I think the film is very exciting and fun. I think it's well shot, and it does have a very interesting world to explore, so it's a shame it's so underdeveloped. The main characters aren't that interesting, and they have no character development, but the monsters in this movie are awesome. Dragons, dinosaurs, a cat pirate. It's a fun time, but the biggest issue is the last 30 minutes are the best part, and I wish this film had been more like that. This film could have benefited from being more fleshed out, but I still have a lot of fun with it. Number eight, Assassin's Creed. I think the story of this movie is actually pretty interesting, with this idea that you can connect your ancestors to this program, though I find its MacGuffin story a bit weak. It's got some well-stylized action, but I think it needed more of the parkour element, since that's what the games are famous for. And the film also kind of treats the audience like they're stupid, because it repeats the goal like every 10 minutes, as if we'll forget what they're looking for. I think it probably could have benefited from a longer runtime, because it feels like it's too focused on trying to build a franchise, and at times can be very rushed. I still think it's fun, and it is, frankly, one of the better movies on this list, though I get that it's not a very high bar. Number seven, Ratchet and Clank. I had absolutely no idea what to expect going into this movie, and for what it was, I thought it was fun. At times, it kind of reminded me of the old Buzz Lightyear cartoon. It had some decent humor. It wasn't super crass or lowbrow. I thought the animation was pretty good. Not an amazing movie, but for what it was, I thought it was fun. Number six, Rampage. This movie has an absolute bonkers premise, but man, is it fun. It's Dwayne Johnson teaming up with a giant gorilla to find a flying wolf and a giant alligator. It's stupid, but it's fun. It's just a big, dumb junk food movie. It's like a higher-budget, schlocky B-movie, mindless, dumb monsters. Not a lot of substance to it, just mindless action. If you can buy into its ridiculous premise, I think there's a lot of fun with it. Number five, Pokemon Detective Pikachu. What's great is that this movie is very accessible. Even if you're not familiar with Pokemon, you can still follow what's going on. They explained about the rules of Pokemon and how things work. And I think it's kind of similar to Who Framed Roger Rabbit mixed with Zootopia because you've got the humans with the cartoons and it's a detective story, but instead of human detective and cartoon, it's cartoon detective and human. And then it's got the Zootopia element of why are the predators going insane? Why are the Pokemon going insane? Ryan Reynolds, of course, he's very funny in this movie. The CGI is fantastic. There's a lot of texture to all the different Pokemon, like Pikachu, you can see the fuzz, and you can see the smooth skin on the turtle Pokemon, and they're absolutely adorable. They're well animated. I think it has a fun story. Number four, Sonic the Hedgehog. This movie is pretty funny, though it has way too many modern references and cringy product placements that kind of pull the movie out of it. At times, it doesn't really feel like a Sonic movie. It feels like another movie that's trying to be a little bit more hip. Probably could have benefited from being more of a Sonic, more of the Sonic lore. And Jim Carrey, he gives a very mixed performance. At times, he can be funny, but at times, he can also be very annoying. And like I said with Sonic the Hedgehog 2, the same thing applies here. The human characters are very boring. 
Frankly, I think this should have been more sci-fi and cartoony, more like the Sonic X cartoon instead of trying to be like real world. Number three, Uncharted. Now, this movie is very inconsistent with the story. And what I mean by that is the plot of the film by itself, not connected to the games, but looking at it just as a movie, is totally fine. But if we're going into the movie with the mindset that they got Tom Holland and Mark Wahlberg to play younger versions of the characters from the game, because it's a prequel like the TV show Young Indiana Jones, it can kind of not work sometimes. Because it's a prequel, there's a lot of action scenes that have happened to them twice. Because there's a ton of scenes in this game that are lifted directly from the other games such as the airplane sequence and the sequence involving pirate ships. That means that if you took this movie as a prequel, those situations happen to these characters twice. So that doesn't make sense. So I don't look at this as a prequel. I look at it as an amalgamation of the first three games, with a bit of a prequel of spin, maybe set in an alternate universe, because this does show Nathan Drake's first encounters with Sully and Chloe, and explains why when you meet Chloe in the second game, she doesn't, she's not too fond of Nate. So it is a prequel in that sense, but the action sequences and puzzles are all directly lifted from the first three games. Just know that going into it, don't try to connect to the games. Keep them separate, you'll probably enjoy this movie a lot more. But like I said, they really put effort into this. It captures the spirit and tone of the games almost perfectly. The sense of fun and adventure are recreated so well. And Holland, even though he is a bit too young, did the best job he could. He has a really sharp dynamic with Mark Wahlberg. They bounce off each other very well. Wahlberg keeps the loving sarcasm that his character Sully in the games does. It's a very believable dynamic. And Tom Holland even has a really good dynamic with the love interest in this. Everyone in the cast works so well off each other. Antonio Banderas is great as the villain. He absolutely steals every scene he's in, but he's also very underused. Technically, he's the main villain, but his henchmen get more screen time than he does. And the way he wrote, he's written is also kind of blamed, but I mean, the villains in the games, they're also written kind of blamed. So there you go, take that as you will. And my only really other criticism is it's very clear who paid for this movie, because just like Sonic, there's some very interface product placements, and I don't mean by Sony. There's a scene where the main joke is about making a wrong turn into a Papa John's, and it lasts for way too long, it's very awkward and out of place, kind of took me out of the film. That's honestly it. And as somebody who did play all the games, I had a fantastic time with this movie. I don't know what people are talking about when they say they hate it. I had a grin on my face the whole time. It was a fun, slick adventure movie. I thought it had very well done, fun action, very likable actors, very likable characters, and a script that harkens back to older adventure films. It's fun escapism, and it's definitely an adventure worth going on. Number two, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. Again, very creative, very fun story. That's a lot of really great action. I think Jake Gyllenhaal and the other person in this movie, they have, Gemma Otterton, they have a very good dynamic. And of course, you got Dr. Octopus in this movie as one of the side villains. You got Ben Kingsley as one of the villains. They're all great in this. I think Gyllenhaal and Otterton have a really fun dynamic. It's a fun adventure. That's an interesting world with well-established rules with this dagger that can turn back time but only gets filled with like this magic sand. It's fun. It's got some good action. I think it's well-styled. It's well-directed. It's the same director as Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, which is personally my favorite Harry Potter film. There's a little bit of influence to that as well. I think it's a fun time. And coming in at first place is the Super Mario Brothers movie from 2023. How interesting and appropriate that last place is the Mario movie from 93, which was the first video game movie, and first place is the latest video game movie, which is Mario from 2023. A 30-year gap exactly, and it's almost it's how parallel these are. That just shows how far we come. And frankly, out of all the movies on this list, this is probably the only video game movie besides maybe Detective Pikachu that's accessible to everybody. There was a lot of passion, effort, and love put into this. I mean, the first 10 minutes alone have a ton of references and Easter eggs to the world of Mario, and that's just the first 10 minutes. But in its quick but effective 80 minute runtime, there are plenty more. Yes, Mario fans, you are going to have an absolute smorgasbord of references. Does it work even if you're not super deep into the Mario lore? Yes, yes it does. This is a very crowd pleasing film that can be enjoyed by everyone, even if you haven't played a Mario game in your life. The world of this movie is very bright and vibrant and is super fun to spend time in. The characters in the world are incredibly well animated with a ton of expression that's also careful not to be too exaggerated. And while the plot moves a little fast, there's also not much plot to draw from, from the games, as honestly, they're relatively simple. But that's also part of the charm. Since the trailer came out, people have been very divided on the casting of Chris Pratt as Mario, and in my opinion, I think for the most part, he did a great job. The voice acting in this film was nearly seamless, feeling true to the spirit of the characters. Every once in a while, Pratt's real voice will seep through, but it's honestly not that big of an issue. 
The best performance by far in this movie is Jack Black as Bowser. He absolutely steals the show, has a ton of fun, and is unrecognizable. And I think the only time he sounds like Jack Black is when he sings a villain song. When he speaks, it's a totally different voice, and it feels perfect for Bowser. It feels totally unique, and it fits the character. The only performance I had an issue with was Seth Rogen as Donkey Kong, and even that's not a bad performance. It just, it just sounds exactly like Seth Rogen. Everyone else is trying their hardest to make their performances feel like the characters and sound very distinct. Then he got Seth Rogen playing himself, not even bothering to disguise his voice. And it does fit the character to some degree, but it also really makes it hard to separate the two. And I do have one or two issues. Mainly, there is an overuse of pop songs in this film, and it honestly doesn't fit. Like, there's a training montage when Mario first enters the Mushroom Kingdom, where he's trying to learn about the power-ups. And it's straight out of one of the Mario platformers. But instead of using the actual Mario music, which would have made the scene much better, they instead use the song I Need a Hero, and there's another scene that uses the song Thunderstruck, which again, these could have just been score from the games. Like, it's something like Shrek using real-world songs in a fantasy setting that works because it's set in a world that's anachronistic. Here, it feels out of place. These aren't totally glaring issues, but they did leave me somewhat bewildered. Super Mario Bros., though, is a wildly entertaining crowd pleaser, perfect for all ages. It's definitely worth the coins. And there you go. That's my ranking of all the video game movies that I've seen. Let me know yours down in the comments, and let me know what your favorite video game movie is.